cure for get rid. Right. So our particular research is focused on two areas. The first one that we've been really working very hard on is the idea um, that some frogs have beneficial skin bacteria growing on their skin. And some of those beneficial skin bacteria produce antifungal compounds. So we, we took um, a, a beneficial skin bacteria called Janthinobacterium lividium, and it's bright purple. And the purple color is from the violacine, which is the antifungal chemical that it produces. Oh. We took that, that, that bacterium and we put it on panamanian golden frogs and then exposed those, the surplus-bred frogs to uh, the chytrid fungus to see if the bacteria would protect them. Unfortunately, the bacteria didn't grow very well on the golden frog skin. And so there was no a uh, very strong protective effect of that treatment. And, but we, we, we are continually learning more about which bacteria do grow on golden frog skin and which ones have very strong antifungal properties. So we are still actively pursuing the idea that we might be able to have a probiotic therapy where you take these, these endangered frogs and, and give them a treatment with a good skin bacteria and see if they can um, resist the chytrid fungus prior to release trials. So that's, that's really the end game for that line of research. The second line of research we've been looking at is with, even within a species, if you expose 100 different frogs to the chytrid fungus of the same species, and half of them live and half of them die, mm -hmm. there are differences between the frogs that have the two different disease outcomes. And so we've been looking very carefully at the genetic differences between frogs that have different disease susceptibility and trying to identify whether there might be some genetic signature that we could identify in frogs that are predisposed to survive from the disease. If we could find that, I'm hopeful that we could selectively breed frogs to be resistant to the chytrid fungus. Mm. Um, and maybe that's the way in which we get the frogs back into the wild. So why should we care if amphibians survive or go extinct? First, there are human cultural reasons we care about frogs and their relatives. Ever since our ancestors became truly human, we have revered certain iconic animals, and frogs have been ubiquitous symbols of rebirth for humans. They are symbols for rain and symbols for life in many cultures. Second, we use frogs for our own benefits. Although some Americans might not warm up to this idea, the world's humans eat almost 80,000 tons of frog legs each year. We also buy millions of frogs and salamanders as pets each year, including fire-bellied toads, poison dart frogs, and some of the colorful Asian salamanders. And each year we use millions of frogs in medical research and testing programs. Last, and certainly not least, we have seen that amphibians provide ecological and economic services to the world. If this still seems hard to believe, consider this. Adult amphibians eat mosquitoes and other invertebrates, which helps to control small disease-carrying pests around human population. A population of 1,000 tiny tree frogs, each about one inch long, consumes an estimated 5 million mosquitoes, gnats, and other pesky creatures every single year. Amphibians play a crucial role in the food web, especially as predators and as prey for other animals and loss of amphibians would result in disastrous ecosystem-wide effects in terrestrial and aquatic environments. If you want to be awed daily by our natural world, watch and develop a better understanding of the frogs, toads, and salamanders that share this magnificent planet with us. Find out about amphibian conservation activities in your area. Engage with a local Frog Watch chapter Participate with iNaturalist or your local zoo or aquarium in recording the amphibians in your area. 
or help organizations like Smithsonian and Amphibian Arc that are helping us save amphibians for future generations. Have you ever watched a turtle in a park, a zoo, or a nature reserve and wondered, why do reptiles look and behave the way they do? Many people fear reptiles. They look primitive and are extremely different from humans. Furthermore, people actually are attacked by crocs and gators. But most reptiles are harmless to humans if you leave them alone. In this lecture, let's explore adaptations of reptiles. We'll cover topics including the evolution of water-retaining amniotic eggs and sensory adaptations, the role of reptiles in our environment, and how we can help reptiles thrive on our planet. Among the vertebrates, there are about 30,000 species of fish, almost 7,000 species of amphibians, about 10,000 species of birds, and about 10,000 species of reptiles. The reptiles have adapted to life on land by enclosing the watery environment that gives life with a water-retaining egg and a watertight skin. The reptile group includes turtles, lizards, and snakes, which make up the order Squamata, the New Zealand reptiles known as Tuatara, and the big reptilian predators of the order Crocodilia. These animals combine primitive, advanced, generalized, and specialized adaptations for life on Earth. If the last time you studied zoology was in high school, you may be surprised to learn that zoologists often group the reptiles with birds these days. They do this because of cladistics. Recall in an earlier lecture our discussion of the cladistic approach. In cladistics, we group various taxa by common evolutionary descent rather than separating them by differences. For example, in cladistics, humans, chimps, and gorillas are included in the hominidae family rather than being separated into humans and apes. Similarly, crocodilians and birds are also grouped into the archosaur clade based on several derived characteristics. They are more closely related to each other than either crocodilians or birds is related to other reptiles. And the archosaurs includes the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are more closely related to birds and crocs than they are to any other living reptiles. The sister clade of the archosaurs is the lepidosaurs. That's where we find snakes and lizards. The two clades, archosaurs and lepidosaurs, are off also descended from a common ancestor. So together they form the group Reptilia. The result is we now use the term non-avian reptiles to refer to the living turtles, lizards, snakes, tuataras, and crocodilians, along with extinct dinosaurs. Let's look at some of the characteristics that birds and non-avian reptiles share. Birds and non-avian reptiles both share a single middle ear bone. Compare that to mammals, which have three. Both have a lower jaw consisting of five or six bones. The jaw of a mammal has one bone. Both lay large, yoked eggs. Crocs and birds have two features that are not in other reptiles. They have a bony eye socket called an orbit that is shaped like an inverted triangle. And they both have muscular gizzards as part of their digestive tracts. Unlike bird eggs, which are always hard-shelled, non-avian reptiles' eggs may be hard-shelled or soft-shelled and leathery. Mineralized shells provide mechanical support and limit water loss while allowing passage of gases. Both mineralized and leathery eggs serve to keep the embryo moist during development 
an adaptation for life on land. The amniotic egg has four membranes on the outside of the embryo, the amnion, allantois, chorion, and yolk sac. The amnion cushions the embryo in aqueous fluid. Food is provided by yolk from the yolk sac, and metabolic wastes are stored in the allantois. The chorion is the thin membrane just inside the shell, is highly vascularized, and surrounds all inner contents of the egg. As the embryo grows, the allantois and chorion fuse and form an organ for exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide across the porous shell. Alligators, turtles, as well as some snakes and lizards, lay their eggs in nests. This is called oviparous reproduction. But because sperm cannot penetrate the eggshell, reptiles must reproduce by internal fertilization. That said, many lizards and snakes lack shelled eggs because they are viviparous, which means they give live birth. Viviparous reproduction provides greater protection for the embryo from predators and dehydration. It is common for reptiles that live in environments that, that are colder environments or environments with warm seasons that are too short for optimal development of eggs. Live-bearing reptiles include North American garter snakes, northern water snakes, and timber rattlesnakes, all of which may be found as far north as New England and Canada. So how do reptiles achieve internal fertilization? Well, crocodilians and turtles have a fairly normal penis, while snakes and lizards have hemipenes to introduce sperm into the female. Hemipenes are paired outcroppings of the cloaca that form a special reptilian forked penis and are normally inverted and held inside the body, but are everted and extended for mating. Although these organs are often forked, only one half is used during mating when it's inserted into the female. Hemipenes often have spines or hooks to help hold them in place during copulation. While hemipenes may seem strange to us, they are the most common copulatory organ in amniotes. There are three fascinating things about reptilian reproductive adaptations. The first is sperm storage. The second is parthenogenesis. And the third is temperature dependent sex determination. First, let's look at sperm storage. Many female reptiles, like the amphibians that evolved before them, are able to mate at one time and fertilize eggs at another. This trait is considered a symplesiomorphy, that is, a shared ancestral trait that is not indicative of current close taxonomic relationships. Specialized tubules for sperm storage evolved independently in turtles, lizards, and snakes. In most turtles, the tubules are in the oviduct, at the end furthest from the ovary. The tubules are basically glands that also secrete albumin. In some turtles, the tubules are in the uterus instead. In iguanid lizards, the sperm storage tubules are vaginal, and they do not secrete albumin. In the primitive tuataras and in the crocodilians, sperm storage is poorly studied, so we don't know if or where it exists. The bottom line? No matter where it occurs, long-term sperm storage is an adaptation that allows reptiles to delay fertilization and hatching until better conditions are available for laying and hatching eggs. The second of our reptilian reproductive adaptations is parthenogenesis. Previously, we looked at parthenogenesis in bees. But for the perspective on reptiles, let's go to Lauren Augustine in the Smithsonian National Zoo's reptile house. You have a new baby in the house. Tell me about that. Yes, we're really excited. Uh, just a few days ago, we had a Asian water dragon, which is Physognathus coccineus, hatch. Um, and it's a really special baby because we've had this female in our collection for over eight years. And she has never been with a male while she's been here at the National Zoo. And she has laid eggs, and they are developing and fertile. And we have one hatchling so far. 
So wow. yeah, it's really exciting. So it might be a case of parthenogenesis. Can yes. you tell me a little bit more about parthenogenesis? Yes, so we suspect this is parthenogenesis, which is basically asexual reproduction. So a female can lay viable eggs without fertilization, so without a male. And the babies are basically little female clones of the mother. And so we're really excited. We do have a genetics team here at the Smithsonian, so we will be testing them just to make sure. Um, but it's the first case of parthenogenesis for the species. Wow. If this isn't parthenogenesis, what's the other hypothesis of how this female who's been here for eight years without being with a male could have had babies? So before we got her, she was housed with her siblings at the St. Louis Zoo. Um, and there were a couple that were suspected to be males in that clutch. And so when she was four months old, there is a very, very slim potential that she could have been holding or having sperm storage since that point which is also really exciting because this would be one of the longest cases of sperm storage for this species as well. Do you often see sperm storage in reptiles? Yeah, so most notably in turtles, um, they can hold sperm for quite a long time, but I would not be surprised if it's in a lot of other species. What are the advantages and disadvantages of parthenogenesis? The advantages of parthenogenesis are that you can breed very quickly and colonize an area, a new habitat, very quickly. So you can increase your population size much quicker than with sexual reproduction. Because you don't have to go out and find a male. Right. The disadvantage is that you have very little genetic variability, which means that you're not able to adapt to a changing environment via natural selection. And so we all know that environments are constantly changing, and it makes these populations very susceptible. Hmm. So sometimes. We've seen iguanas, tortoises, other reptiles kind of, we suspect that they rafted from the mainland over to an island. There's a possibility that, that those females, those might have been females and it might have been parthenogenesis and then they exploded quickly on the So on that's the one of the ideas is that we would only need one female to make it to a new habitat such as an island and then she would be able to colonize that whole island via parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis can be induced by captivity because she does have a lot of resources in captivity and does not have a mate. And so that might be what may have like sparked her to go into asexual reproduction. You know, one of the things is the females are surviving and doing very well, and so they want to pass on their own genetics because they're doing really well. And so there's no need to mix genes, but that won't always last. The third interesting thing about reptile reproduction is temperature-dependent sex determination or TSD. In short, the sex of many reptiles is determined by the ambient temperature of the nest. This phenomenon was first described in agamid lizards in the 1960s by the French zoologist Madeleine Charnier, but it takes place in a number of other reptiles, and each species responds differently to these temperature changes. In many turtle species, Eggs from warmer nests result in all female hatchlings, while eggs from cooler nests result in all male hatchlings. Some crocodilian species show TSD that is just the opposite. Low nest temperatures, less than 30 degrees Celsius, produce only females, while high nest temperatures, above 34 degrees Celsius, produce only males. But in the American alligator, the low and high temperatures result in female hatchlings, while intermediate temperatures produce all males. Not all reptiles are affected by TSD. Zoologists suggest that there are two types of sex determination in the reptile group, TSD and gen genotypic sex determination, or GSD. TSD occurs during a critical period of incubation called the thermosensitive period. The critical period occurs after the egg has been laid. In GSD, sex determination occurs at fertilization. As we know, mammals and birds have sex chromosomes that determine gender of the animals, and so do some reptiles. Several species of turtles and lizards have X and Y sex chromosomes like mammals, with homogametic females having two identical X chromosomes and heterogametic males having one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. Other reptiles have a chromosomal structure similar to that we find in birds with Z and W sex chromosomes. 
In this case, males are the homogametic sex, having two identical ZZ chromosomes, and females are the heterogametic sex, having one Z and one W chromosome. This is the same as it is in birds. What's really interesting is TSD and GSD are not mutually exclusive. Zoologists have shown temperature reversal of genetically determined sex. These studies suggest that some reptiles may show transitional evolutionary state between complete GSD and complete TSD. There are several hypotheses that may explain the adaptive significance of TSD. One is that TSD arose in a single species around 300 million years ago and somehow gave an adaptive advantage to all its descended species. It is also possible that TSD is adaptively neutral. In other words, it's neither an advantage nor a disadvantage, so it survives in these species more or less by accident. Another hypothesis is that TSD is favored over GSD when single-sex clutches of eggs are more fit than mixed-sex clutches for a particular species. In a test of these hypotheses using painted turtles, zoologists discovered that hatchlings from same-sex nests had better hatchling size, energy efficiency, and first-year survivorship than hatchlings from mixed-sex nests. These results suggest that natural selection does favor TSD. Think about how a warming climate might affect species that have TSD. Many species could go extinct because TSD is no longer an advantage in a warmer climate, throwing off the male to female ratio and affecting reproductive rate. The good news is that there is historic evidence that during climate extremes, species have somehow reverted to genotypic sex determination, perhaps through selection pressure. Those that are able to revert to GSD may simply survive and reproduce better than those that do not. One of the most noticeable differences between amphibians and reptiles is the skin. Reptiles have dry skin that feels like your dry sneaker, unlike the moist skin of amphibians that makes them vulnerable to dehydration on dry land. A shift away from the amphibian skin's respiratory function is associated with changes in skin morphology. Under, unlike the bony, dermally derived scales we find in fishes, Reptile scales are made of keratin from the epidermis. The epidermal hard form of keratin in reptile skin not only makes the skin watertight, it provides protection against wear and tear in the terrestrial environment. Different types of reptiles have different types of scales. Turtles have plate-like scutes. The scutes develop new layers of keratin as they wear down. In crocodiles and alligators, scales remain in place and grow gradually throughout life to repair the wear. Lizards and snakes have famously evolved a shedding interval. New keratinized epidermis grows beneath the old outer scale layer, then the old is shed. The skin and eyes of these creatures have chromatophores, color-bearing cells that give them their amazing colors. These skins are prized by humans for alligator and snakeskin leathers, which are then made into handbags and shoes, sometimes causing conservation threats for the desirable species. Reptiles have stronger jaws than fish and amphibians. Turtles and tortoises have bony jaws covered with keratin, and they have no teeth. The jaws are strong enough to grab and tear at plant material, and the tongue is muscular, and can help move food around. These adaptations evolved as a response to their herbivorous dietary niche. In most reptiles, bony joints allow the snout and upper jaw to move on the rest of the skull. The quadrate bone is the hindmost part of the upper jaw joint, and it can move at both its dorsal and ventral extremes, that is, at both the lower jaw and pterygoid bone which is part of the palate. Even the snout bones can be raised to open the mouth wide or lowered to maximize bite force between the jaws. 
Birds and most reptiles have two pairs of temporal openings in their skulls, known as the diapsid condition. The lower temporal opening is very large with no lower border in modern lizards, and this makes space for expansion of the large jaw muscles these creatures use for eating. These jaw adaptations have allowed the thousands of reptile species to adapt to different diets, including the mostly vegetarian diets of turtles and tortoises, and the live prey diets of snakes and crocs. Just as turtles and lizards adapted to herbivorous, omnivorous, and carnivorous lifestyles, all snakes evolved to become carnivores. The snakes include non-venomous as well as venomous species, depending on their prey and their ecological niche. The common garter snake of North America is a harmless, non-venomous snake that eats slugs, earthworms, tadpoles, and other small creatures. Because of this, it has a relatively small mouth and small teeth that are adapted to manipulating its small prey. Meanwhile, non-venomous Old World pythons and New World boas can eat large vertebrate animals like deer because of their large size and ability to disarticulate and rearticulate their jaws. And rattlesnakes and their pit viper relatives are venomous and kill rodents for food, which they do not chew. They simply swallow them whole. The skull of snakes is more mobile than that of lizards due to several movable bones, which enables snakes to swallow much larger prey. Although the two halves of the lizard upper jaw, the mandible, are joined by bone, the two halves of the snake's lower jaw are united by flexible muscle and skin, which allows snakes to spread their jaw bones widely and allows independent movement of each side. Additionally, many snake skull bones are so loosely articulated that the entire skull can flex asymmetrically. And this also helps snakes to swallow their enormous prey whole. Snakes slowly swallow their prey by moving their recurved teeth over the prey. As one side of the jaws and palate are stabilized by anchoring these teeth in the prey, the other side slowly advances, ratcheting the prey deeper into the snake's mouth. Of course, a snake needs to keep breathing during the slow process of swallowing, so its glottis, or tracheal opening, is pushed forward between the two sides of the lower jaw which keeps this breathing organ operating. Crocodiles and alligators have huge, well-reinforced skulls and jaw musculature adapted to eating large prey through a wide mouth opening and very fast and powerful closure of the jaws. Unlike other reptiles, these creatures also have a complete secondary palate, an adaptation only found in mammals among all the other vertebrates. This evolutionary advance pushed the internal nares to the back of the nasal passage, which allows these creatures to breathe as long as their nostrils are above the water surface. At the back of the throat, there is a palatal valve, which allows a crocodilian to keep water from entering its esophagus when its mouth is filled with food or water. Some crocodiles grow to hundreds of pounds and are known to attack large mammals like deer, antelope, cattle, and even people. So crocs and gators really need this adaptation when they are eating large prey. Incredible old age records are often claimed for reptiles. Many turtles live for 50 to 60 years, with one box turtle aged 124 years, and a giant tortoise documented to reach an age of 152 years. Well-documented ages for alligators are in the 50 to 65 year range, and some species have been documented living well into their 80s in captivity. There are lizards like Gila monsters that have lived 25 to 30 years. Many snakes live 10 to 25 years, and one boa constrictor in a zoo where there's free food and veterinary care had a documented age of 40 years. So the answer is yes, individual animals of this ancient reptilian lineage can live a long time, and some live a very long time. The adaptations that allow these reptiles to survive to such an old age include the ones we have already talked about, 
as well as water conserving nitrogen excretion, rib ventilation of the lungs in crocodilians, lizards, and snakes, higher pressure cardiovascular systems, and an expanded brain and sensory organs. Almost all reptiles have very good eyesight, olfactory senses, and ability to hear. And did you know that even the snakes, although very quiet and without external ears, can actually hear? Studies have shown that pythons can detect airborne sounds between 80 and 160 hertz, around the frequency of the lowest cello notes, apparently because of vibration in their skull bones. We still do not know how many of the 3,000 snake species can hear this way, since it has been shown previously that several can sense vibrations through the ground, so their abilities to sense vibrations through the air might be reduced. Crocodilians, unlike snakes, but like their relatives, the birds, have external ears. Remember, the crocodilians are the non-avian reptiles most closely related to birds. I've heard baby crocodilians chirp to their doting mothers from inside their eggs. And of course, they vocalize after they have hatched as well. Male alligators bellow loudly during the breeding season. I like to imagine that the age of dinosaurs sounded a lot like these modern creatures. There certainly is auditory communication in the dinosaur's modern relatives. Unlike most other non-avian reptiles, crocodilians pro provide extensive maternal care. The mother can hear the vocalizations from her hatching young, and she opens the nest to allow the hatchlings to emerge easily. She may even gently open eggs to help the young to hatch out. She then guards her young for up to two years after hatching. The infant crocodiles are capable of catching their own small prey and also feed on small pieces that fall from their mother's mouth while she's eating nearby. Although many reptilian species have survived unchanged for millions of years, growing human populations, habitat conversion for human use, and climate change have all contributed to declining reptile populations around the world. Not much is known about the status of reptiles globally, though. Among the 10,000 or so species of non-avian reptiles, fewer than 1,400 have been evaluated by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. But 35% of reptile species worldwide that have been evaluated by IUCN are considered threatened or endangered. Let's go back to Laura and Augustine to discuss what the National Zoo is doing for threatened and endangered reptiles. Laura, this is one of the most beautiful turtles I've ever seen. Tell me about this box turtle. This is a species of Asian box turtle. So its scientific name is Corora beretii. Uh, in the genus Corora, there are 12 species of semi-aquatic box turtles. Um, and so they were once, and they still are, very coveted in the pet trade because they are so beautiful and pretty long-lived. Box turtles can live a very long time. And so we are one of the only zoos that has this species in captivity right now. Um, and they were, at one time, very prolific in the United States because of the pet trade. But now they're critically endangered and listed as CITES-1. And so legal importation has basically stopped. And what are the current threats to Asian box turtles and other Asian turtles and tortoises? So the biggest threat to Asian turtles and tortoises is overcollection for local food and international food and pet trade. So these guys are being harvested rampantly for food, medicinal purposes, but also just to feed local poverty-stricken populations. What are some of the things that people can do to help save Asian box turtles and other critically endangered turtles and tortoises? Unfortunately, with very little enforcement going on in Asia, trying to track down the people who are poaching these turtles, our biggest hope for some of these species is captive propagation. And so organizations like the Turtle Survival Alliance, who are dedicated to saving turtles like this, this species particularly, um, are really important. And so supporting organizations like that, but also being um, smart about where you get your pets. People are still interested in getting these turtles for pets because they are so beautiful and rare and it makes them coveted in the pet trade. So knowing where you're getting your pet from, trying to get captive bred animals is also really important for the species. So how can you help these creatures survive? First, 
don't buy reptile skin products when you travel internationally because many of those products are from unknown or endangered species. Don't buy reptiles as pets because the ongoing trade was a, has a huge impact on the wild populations of these creatures. Support legislation that protects reptile habitat, even if it means humans will have fewer roads or housing developments. The future of reptiles may help to determine the future of mankind because these wonderful animals occupy so many important habitats.